so probability theory enables us to reason about our uncertainty. Now, a key distinction that informs how we handle a particular random variable is if it's discrete or continuous. If we're ever dealing with a finite set of possible values, say a categorical label from an animal classification model, then this is a discrete random variable. But discrete random variables can also apply to infinite target spaces as well, specifically countably infinite, like the natural numbers. Some of our intuitive notions of probability from everyday life transfer over to discrete probabilities, where we can think of the probability assigned to each possible state as the fraction of times that particular state is likely to occur. For example, say it's late, we're tired and hungry, and we're randomly picking a piece of fruit out of the fridge, with an equal chance of picking any particular piece. If we have three apples, one pear, and four oranges, the probabilities of picking each type of fruit are three-eighths, one-eighth, and one-half, respectively. We represent these with a probability mass function, or PMF, essentially a list of probabilities for each possible state. For any discrete distribution, the probabilities must all lie between 0 and 1 inclusively, and sum to 1. That is, the total probability must be 1. Now a quick note on notation. We use both of these to refer to the probability of the random variable big X taking on a particular value, little x. When we have multiple discrete random variables, we can visualize the joint distribution as a table where entry ij contains the probability of both xi and yj occurring. If we define a new random variable z as the tuple xy, then z's target space is the Cartesian product of both x and y's target spaces. So here there would be 15 possible states. Our constraints from before still apply, and the sum of all the probabilities must still equal 1. In a multivariable setting like this, the marginal probability of one of the random variables, say x, taking a particular value, regardless of the value of any of the other variables, is denoted as just p of x. For example, the marginal probability here of x taking value x3, so p of x3, is the sum of the entries in the third row. We say we're marginalizing out y and just considering x. You've also likely encountered conditional probability before, where we explicitly set the values of certain random variables and then consider the distribution of some remaining ones. So say here we want to know the conditional probability of y given x. So we can set the random variable x to some value, say x1, and then we can ask, what's the distribution of y given this fact? So, for example, what's p of y2 given x1? Well, we would look at the first row only and determine what fraction is given by y2. Here, that would be 0.3. We'll explore conditional probability and how to reason about multiple random variables in more detail a bit later in the course. Now, continuous random variables can be slightly trickier than their discrete counterparts. Here, we'll be considering continuous random variables that take values in the reals. For example, the time it takes an experiment to complete, or a person's exact height. We represent the distribution in a continuous setting with a probability density function, or PDF, often denoted by little f or little p of x. Let's look at an example. Imagine we have a very precise clock that can give us the exact amount of time an experiment takes to complete. Not just, say, to the nearest millisecond, but exact. Now ignore for the moment the actual physical plausibility of this, and let's just assume it exists. We're told the duration follows this probability density function. So how do we interpret this? Do we look at a particular time value on the x-axis, find its corresponding y-axis value, and say, that's the probability for that duration? Well, not exactly. Instead, the probability density function tells us how to evaluate probabilities over intervals. We say the probability of x being between values a and b is the integral of the PDF from a to b, that is the area under the function from a to b. 
For any interval of interest, we simply adjust the integral accordingly. So can we ask what the probability of hitting a particular value is? Well, this basically means setting the interval of integration to zero width, of course resulting in an evaluation of zero. So p of big x equaling little x for any individual value x is zero, which feels a bit weird when you first see this. But as soon as we expand the interval to some non-zero width, we have some chance of hitting a value in this range. Now, like the probability mass function, the probability density function also comes with some constraints. The PDF must always be non-negative, and in addition, the integral of the PDF over all the reals must equal 1. And unlike for the discrete case, here, any particular value of the PDF is actually allowed to be greater than 1. We can see this with a simple example. Say x is governed by a uniform distribution between 1 and 3. That is, it is equally likely to have any value in this interval. The PDF in this case would be a constant function at 1 half. But if we decrease the interval of possible x values to be from, say, 1 to 1.5, then the PDF instead will sit at 2, ensuring that the total area is still 1. Continuous densities can also be extended to multivariable settings. In a two-dimensional case, we have the x and y axes each represent one of the variables, and z represent the PDF. The probability for any two-dimensional interval of interest is given by the corresponding volume under the PDF surface. It's a bit difficult to visualize, but this actually generalizes to any number of higher dimensions, 